try to bring a few people, obviously. No, that's great. Well, I, I, I told Tom, it's, it's uh, nice to at least have a few bodies in the room. So what do we call them when it's at work? Are we on the gut? Sweet little. Yeah, that we like to call him when he's in trouble at work or anything like Tom? that? Tom? Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. He's in a different department, so I, I, I don't find out when he's Tom in trouble. Tom in the other department. Yeah. That's, that's, that's me. That'd, that'd be me. Yeah. Right. That's right. <laughs> he's on the other side of campus. Right. Yeah. I mean, he, he, you know. I'm a mild corner. Yeah, right. They're in those old World War II barracks. Is that your computer? I wonder. I've got my sound turned off. Oh, we're both on mute. I can. Let me. What are you doing? I think it's it's picking up from the mic. Well, I'm I'm hearing it on here, but I'm on mute. My microphone's muted and my sound is off. Oh, my sound is on. Okay, that one's probably going. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, I'm good if you guys are good. Okay. All right. For the Porter, are we streaming? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Uh, we welcome you to our uh, Cash West Stake Fireside. Uh, welcome you, a uh, few of us in the building here and the majority of us uh, enjoying this uh, through a Zoom webinar. So we welcome everyone. Um, we, uh, I'm Tom Williams, I'm second counselor in stake presidency. We recognize on the stand with us Bryce Bosworth, our stake president and uh, Brian Nielsen, second counselor in the stake presidency. And of course, uh, Patrick Mason, who will be giving us uh, a presentation uh, today. We're grateful that he's here. Grateful that you've joined us. We will uh, begin with uh, an opening prayer uh, from Sister Sherry Porter. I will clean things up here for you. Here. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity that we have to gather and to hear from our speaker and to fill of thy spirit. We ask thee to bless us that we may be able to um, fill of the spirit to teach us and to help us to know the things that we need in our lives to change or to continue doing so that we may draw closer to thee. We are so thankful for all of our leaders and ask thee to please bless President Nelson and all those that associate with him. Please bless our state presidency and all of those that lead and guide us. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Sister Porter. We appreciate that. Well, this is a uh, uh, one of the, the blessings of working at Utah State University is being able to associate with uh, with Patrick Mason, uh, who has been at the university how long? Patrick? Two years. About two years. Two years. Um, came in from California. You were at Claremont Graduate College, Graduate University. Uh, and then uh, he was offered the uh, Arrington chair at USU, and uh, so here he is, and so we, we get to have him here. Um, and this is a very timely message. In recent years, virtually no member of the church has been unaffected by faith crises, uh, whether their own or among someone they love. Um, so how can we faithfully, honestly, and lovingly meet the questions and doubts that often arise both for ourselves and for others. So that's what Patrick Mason will speak to uh, today. Patrick Mason is the author of the book, Planted, Belief and Belonging in an Age of Doubt, published by Deseret Book. 
Uh, he's a professor of religious studies and history at Utah State University. And Patrick and his wife, Melissa, live in Logan with their uh, four children. So we'll turn the time now over to uh, Brother Mason after I clean up the microphone for him here. Thank you, Tom. Didn't know when you were called in the state presidency that you'd also be on janitorial duty uh, up here too. But uh, it's great to, to see uh, uh, those of you who are here, but especially all those who are uh, with us uh, remotely. And uh, these, these are uh, interesting times we're in. I th uh, we're all hoping and praying that things are getting better, of course. And uh, hopefully in a few months, we'll be able to do this kind of thing with a packed house uh, uh, all in person. But uh, for those of you who are at home in your pajamas, uh, 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 you know, eat some Cheetos for me uh, while, uh, while we're here in the, the building. So um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Uh, and it's uh, like, like uh, President Williams said, I, I moved to Logan with my family a couple of years ago. We've had just a fa fantastic experience here. Uh, it's been a great place for us to, to be with our family, to raise our kids, to be part of the community. So, uh, and, and as time goes on, we, we look forward to associating. We'll probably bump into a lot of you in the grocery stores and at other places around town. Uh, so I look forward to getting to know you here as fellow Loganites. But uh, the, the topic that I wanted to talk about tonight is uh, not necessarily an, an easy one for us. Oh. Um, so I need to share my screen. I need to be given permission to do that, if I can get that. Let's try again. Nope. It says a um, disabled participant screen sharing. Maybe I need to be promoted to a panelist or something like that. I don't know. I just did what they told me to. So. <laughs> There we go. All right. Ask and ye shall receive. Okay, so, okay, people in the room can see it. I hope that people at home can see it. So, um, so tonight we're going to talk about a, a topic that can be difficult to talk about, and uh, specifically uh, the issue of, of doubt, of faith crisis, as it's commonly called. And as President Williams noted, I, I doubt that there's anyone in the church, or very many at least, that have not been personally affected, either in their own lives or somebody they know and love, a family member, a close friend, a ward member, somebody who in recent years has had serious questions uh, about their testimony, serious doubts uh, about the church and really struggling with whether or not they would they want to, to stay with the church or or maybe step away from it. So this has affected uh, all of us in a way. And so it's important for us to talk about, even though it's hard to talk about. And um, so that's what we're going to do tonight. And I want to start with this scripture from the New Testament, uh, from the Savior in uh, Luke chapter 18. Uh, it's a passage that might be easy to miss, but I think it, it really speaks to the issue today. And he asks, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? So when the Savior returns, which we believe and know he will, will he find faith? Now, it used to be that I think we could take this as a foregone conclusion. Of course, he'll find people who are faithful. I mean, there's always been people who have believed. There's always been uh, good, strong, faithful disciples of Jesus uh, uh, on the earth. Uh, even during the time when, uh, when our church wasn't on the earth, there were always people who, who believed in Jesus and worshipped him. So it seemed like kind of a foregone conclusion. But if you look at some of the recent statistics and some of the recent numbers that have come out, it doesn't seem like such a foregone conclusion. So I'm going to start with some of these uh, numbers, which um, I'm just going to warn you that the bad news is coming up front here. All right. So, so it's, it's going to look, be a little rocky here for a few minutes, but then things, things will get better. So, so trust me. Um, so there was this study that came out a couple of years ago uh, by a group called the, the Pew Forum. 
And the, the Pew Forum is, is one of the most respected and largest institutions that studies religion in the United States and around the world. Widely respected, uh, quoted and cited by scholars, also by, by church leaders, actually Elder Anderson in a general conference talk recently uh, referred to, to some of these numbers. And so these are well-respected numbers. They published a report a couple of years ago in October of 2019, which as you can see here, talked about the decline of Christianity in the United States. And so I wanna give you some of these numbers. And again, it's, it's a bit of a bleak picture. Now, I know it's gonna be hard for you to see, especially maybe uh, here in the room. So, so let me talk through some of these charts. You'll, you'll get a sense of it just from looking at the direction of some of these lines. But um, so in 2007, if you look at the chart on the left, in 2007, 2008, when Pew called people up or surveyed people, however they did on the phone or on the internet or whatever, and asked people, what religion are you? And this is people in the United States. About 77, 78% of people responded that they were Christian. 10 years later, in 2018, 2019, when Pew asked the exact same question, only 65% of people in America said they were Christian. So in the space of a decade, there was about a 12 or 13 percentage point drop in the number of people saying that they were Christian when asked. During that same decade, from about 2007, 2008 until 2018, the percentage of people who, when they were asked, what religion are you, said none of the above, or I don't go to church, or I, I don't have a church, I don't have a religion, uh, we call them the unaffiliated. Um, there were about 16 or 17 percent who identified that way in 2007, 2008. A decade later, it was up to 26%. On the right-hand side, you, you can see charts. This, they ask people, how often do you go to church? And in 2007, about 54, 55% of Americans said they went to church at least monthly. 10 years later, those numbers had, fl had, had flipped exactly to where the number of people who said they attended church at least monthly was only about 45% and the number of people who said they attended church less regularly than that, which, which could be not at all, was about 54%. So those numbers flipped exactly. Well, you could say, well, those are just percentages. What about actual numbers? That could be explained by immigration or any number of things. Well, here's the actual numbers of people. So during that same decade, from about 2009 to about 2019, the total, the actual number of Christians in the United States declined from about 178 million to 167 million, so a drop of 11 million actual people in the space of a decade who, who self-reported being Christian. Now, the amazing number is the, the line at the bottom, and that traces the number of people who, again, say that they're not affiliated with any religion. This isn't people who are in other religions, like the, they're, they're Jewish or they're Muslim or Hindu or something like that. These are people who claim no religious identity at all in the United States. That jumped from 39 million people in 2009 to 68 million Americans a decade later. 30 million more Americans in the space of only a decade said that they no longer affiliated with any religion at all. That's unbelievable. I mean, we never see those kinds of changes that kind of jump in such a, an important thing like religious identity in the space of only a decade. Okay, and, you, and, and, you, and I know this will be impossible for you to see here in the room, but, but you might say, oh, well, that's just certain kinds of people, but actually the studies show that this is true of every demographic group. So men and women, every generational cohort, every racial group, people who are, uh, have a college education, people who don't have a college education, people in every region of the country, uh, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, in every single demographic group in the United States, we're seeing a significant decline in the number of Christians and a significant increase in the number of people who do not affiliate with any religion. Okay. So all of that just goes to say that, that this, is, this is kind of the overall trend. Sometimes when it happens in your family, right, or in your ward, you, you, you might think like we're the only ones. You might, you might think we're, we're, we're alone in this. But in fact, this is not just an issue for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is not just about our church. This is about all churches in America right now. This is the water we're swimming in right, uh, right now. And if you're a religious person, if you care about religion, uh, times are tough, and we're increasingly swimming against the stream. Now, this chart shows uh, retention rates 
among Latter-day Saints for different generational cohorts. And when, I, when we're talking about retention here, we're not talking about convert retention, the number of adults who get baptized who then stay with the church like a year later or five years. This is about people who are raised in the church who then stay with the church into adulthood, okay? So for people who are in the, the, the silent generation or, or, or the boomer, uh, the baby boomers, uh, the church retained about 72 to 75 percent of those folks. That is phenomenal. I mean, th this is one of the reasons why the church grew so quickly in the, in the last part of the 20th century is because it kept all the kids who were born into the church. And there were a lot of kids born into the church uh, during that time period. And uh, just, just phenomenal compared to, to other churches to, to retain three quarters of the people who are born into your church. You can see it dropped off a little bit in my generation, I'm a Gen Xer, uh, to about 62%, but then among millennials fell off the cliff. And according to this study, different studies show different things, um, but, but, but these, these numbers show that, that uh, the church retains only about 46% of millennials. Again, these are people who are born in the church, raised in the church, who then choose not to stick with the church into adulthood. So less than half, according to this particular study. So we're seeing big changes. I'm going to skip over this because this is going to be impossible for you to see. But basically, uh, not only are we seeing fewer people um, staying with the church, but actually lower levels of confidence um, in some of the church's basic teachings in terms of, of how, how strongly do you feel about such and such a doctrine that, are, that across the generations, um, it's getting uh, less and less. So what do we do with this? Okay, how do we, how do we deal with this? So, so at, at, at once it's, it's a broader general pattern and I'm sure you've all seen this, right? I mean, you've seen this in the broader culture. You've maybe seen this among neighbors. Uh, and other kinds of things, uh, a general pattern in American society of fewer people going to church, fewer people identifying as Christians of, of all sorts, and more and more people being willing to, to publicly say they don't affiliate with religion at all, especially among younger people, especially among millennials and Gen Z, okay? And at the same time, though, lots of people are staying with religion, right? And a lot of people feel as strongly about it as ever. And so how do, we, how do we navigate this? How do we deal with this new reality? And that's what it is, it's a new reality. It's not something we can just wish away. It's not something we can pretend it isn't happening because again, it's happening within our families, it's within our marriages, among, with our friends, among our ward members, right? The people that we love. So this isn't just a theoretical problem. This isn't just a theoretical issue. This is the people that we love. And what happens when somebody that you love decides to leave the church? What do you do? And so this is exactly what led me to, to think about this, to write about this a little bit. And so that's what I want to talk about tonight is to think about, first of all, what is going on? And, and so we'll, we'll shift now from the kind of general American situation and, and now talk specifically about our church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So what is going on? How do we understand it? Why do people leave the church or struggle with doubts and so forth? And how can we minister effectively and honestly and lovingly with compassion, with honesty, uh, when, when people have questions and when people have doubts? Okay, again, it's not just something we can wish away. So now, one thing that I've found is I've talked to lots and lots of people is that every story is different. Of course, every person is different. No, no people, no two people, no two situations are the same. But with that said, I've talked to enough people at this point that, that uh, I begin to see some, some general patterns of some reasons why people struggle uh, and with, with, with doubts about the church and sometimes to such a point that they choose to walk away. So I put these in three different buckets or categories. And again, this is overly generalizing because every person is different, but it, sometimes it helps just to think in terms of general patterns. So I wanna talk tonight about people who feel switched off, people who feel squeezed out, and people who feel tuned out. So switched off, squeezed out, and tuned out. Okay, so what do I mean by these? All right, so first of all, switched off. What I mean here is generally people who struggle with their testimony, struggle with the church because of doctrinal or historical or intellectual issues. 
They find some aspect of the church his, church's history that troubles them, some aspect of the, the church's doctrine taught either present or past uh, that, that really troubles them. So it's, it's kind of a, it, it's, it's a struggle with them in, in terms of how they think about the church. And let me give you, again, every story is different, but let me give you an example of what this might look like. For a lot of folks, um, it begins actually quite innocently. I mean, they are, they are firmly grounded in the church. They're active, serving in callings and so forth. And they, uh, I've talked to lots of people who it, it begins just with searching on the internet, sometimes to prepare a lesson, you know, a young women's lesson or something like that. And they want to find out uh, additional information about the topic. And so they go, start to, going to do some research and they stumble across something on the internet. Uh, that troubles them, which is a little maybe different from what they've heard at church, something they've never heard about maybe at all. And at first, the impulse might be to simply dismiss it as anti-Mormon garbage, right? Because there's plenty of anti-Mormon garbage on the internet, right? But, but this particular thing, they, as they start to look into it a little bit more, they realize, wait a minute, there's something to this. It isn't just garbage. It's not just made up. There's actually something here. And we know what these issues are. There's, um, uh, the, there, there's a long list, but there's about a dozen or so issues that come up pretty consistently uh, for people. And we know uh, what those issues are because actually the church knows what those issues are because of its own research and from listening to people. And so a few years ago, the church published a series of essays on the church's website, lds.org, now churchofjesuschrist.org, called the Gospel Topics Essays. And probably a lot of you are familiar with these essays. Probably a lot of you have, have seen these, okay? But the church knew exactly what these issues that consistently came up among people, uh, what they were. And so they, they wrote a series of essays. Now, these essays <coughs> were written by historians, people who were professional historians who had spent years studying that topic. Most of them were not employees of the church, uh, so members of the church, but not employees of the church. So, so the church commissioned these outside historians to work on these issues, to write, to come up with the best research. What are the facts about this particular issue? And then they worked alongside the church history department. And then each of these essays, when they were written, then it was sent through the correlation process and went all the way up to the first presidency in Quorum of the Twelve for approval. So every one of these essays, when you go look at them on churchofjesuschrist.org, every single one of these has been written by professional historians who are experts on the topic and approved by the first presidency in Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Now, what are these issues? Again, there's about, I think there's 12 or 13 of these essays. They range on a whole range of topics from race and the priesthood um, to Joseph Smith uh, translating the Book of Mormon using seer stones to uh, Joseph Smith's translation of the Book of Abraham, uh, the Mountain Meadows Massacre, um, questions about polygamy, uh, some more questions about polygamy and some more questions about polygamy. Uh, a lot of questions about polygamy. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, and, and, and then several that, that I'm, I'm forgetting off the top of my head. And, and so, but these were the issues that consistently came up for people that they had questions. And so the church addressed these in, in the best way they could. I mean, now the essays aren't perfect. They're, they're short. There's a lot more to, to, to be said about all of these issues, but these are honest, forthright uh, attempts to talk about these issues in a way that that, um, that 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 actually is not destructive of faith, in which the in which the church puts these things into context. But still, if we go back to that person who found that fact on the internet, okay, found that thing on the internet, and again discovered that wait a minute, this isn't just a lie. There's something to this. Walk with me and think with me through the thought process, or or oftentimes the emotional process of finding that, and and. So a lot of people say, okay, I, I, I found that. And as I dug into it, I realized that there was something to it. And I began to wonder, how come nobody ever told me about this? I've spent my life in the church. I've spent years in the church. I went on a mission. I've served in callings. I went to seminary. I went to institute. I've been to, going to gospel doctrine for years and years and years, right? How come nobody ever told me about this? And then some people say, well, what else aren't they telling me? And there can be, and, and so you, you, can, you can see here what, 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 the, the, uh, what, what the kind of thought process is and what it becomes is a loss of trust, even a sense of betrayal. 
that I've spent years and years going to church or going to church classes, and nobody ever told me about this particular thing. Why not? What are they hiding? Right? And so this loss of trust, faith is nothing if not trust, right? It's just like any relationship. It's really easy to break trust, but it's really hard to build it. And once somebody feels like their trust has been broken it's re, or, or is, is kind of borderline, it's hard to rebuild that. So a lot of people feel like their trust has been lost. And so what do we do when that happens? Okay, for those, and so this is what I mean by people who feel switched off. These are people who at one point felt switched on, right? But then something happens, they learn about something or, or a constellation of things and that leads them to feel switched off. They don't feel the same way they used to. They're, they're not sure if they can listen to and, and trust the leaders of the church, the materials that the church puts out, et cetera. So what do we do when somebody feels switched off? Well, a couple of things that I, that I tell to people who are struggling with this, who are encountering this. So first of all, we don't argue with the facts, right? The facts are what the facts are. And this is exactly what the church tried to address in these gospel topics essays, right? So we don't, don't argue with the facts. We don't try to argue them away. But those facts, whatever they are, those facts do not compel disbelief. And here's what I mean by that. There's a whole lot of people who know all of those facts, all of those things that you just read on Google, right? Or all of those things that you just read on some blog or listened to on a podcast or, or discovered in a book somewhere, all of those things. There are lots and lots of people who have also read those same things and they haven't lost their testimony and they've worked through it and they've found a way actually for their testimony to come out stronger on the other side. And I can say that with confidence because I'm one of those people. Right? I mean, I've, I've spent years studying these kinds of things. My first book was on anti-Mormonism. I've read, I think, pretty much what there is to read out there. Uh, and not only have I come through with my faith intact, but actually my faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ and in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and its leaders has never been stronger. There is a way to deal with these things constructively and productively and to put them within a context and a framework of faith. It does not have to lead to the destruction of one's testimony. Now, again, I understand how tough it is to wrestle with some of these things. Some of these things are hard to wrestle with, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is a way through. And it's important that we recognize that there is hope. And one of the things that we can do is we can disaggregate, we can, we can separate the things that we know, the experiences that we've had, the witness of the spirit that we've had from these kinds of questions that we have. It's not that those questions don't matter, right? But there's a way that we can also hold on to the things that we've felt and the experiences that we've had within the church. And so that we can discern not only truth from error, but also the things that are most important to us and the things that are going to lead us in a life of Christ, now, there's lots more to say, say there, but I, I, I want to move on. And I, I want to talk about what about those who are still switched on, right? What if you're the person who's still in the church and your testimony is still intact and you're still going strong, but that somebody you love is really struggling? What do you do? And I think this is the million dollar question uh, for, for those of us who are still in the church. What do we do to minister and to love those who are struggling with faith crisis. Well, it seems to me the first thing we do is we go back to our baptismal covenant. And remember, the baptismal covenant is sketched out in a few different places in the scripture. My favorite place is in Mosiah chapter 18. You remember this when, when they're baptizing people in the waters of Mormon. And it talks about the covenant that they made as they went, or, went into those waters. And it said that they, were, they covenanted that they were willing to bear one another's burdens, that they might be light, and to mourn with those who mourn, to comfort those who stand in need of comfort. That was the first thing that they covenanted to do. Now, I can tell you, and, and I'm, you've probably had these conversations too, for, for people who are going through faith crisis, it is oftentimes the hardest thing they've gone through in their entire life. It often came uninvited. It often came... Uh, uh, you know, in, in, in ways that people didn't expect. It, it is, it is uh, affecting their relationships. 
and it's affecting their marriages, the relationship with their parents, with other ward members, with other people. There, there's a kind of be bewilderment that, that, that can happen with this. And for a lot of people, it is the hardest thing, the most painful thing they've ever gone through. And so we've covenanted to mourn with those who mourn and comfort those who stand in need of comfort. We don't get to choose, oh, I'm gonna mourn with certain kinds of people and certain kind of mourning, or I'm gonna comfort people who are in need of certain kind of, you know, when somebody breaks their leg, I'm gonna take him a casserole, but faith crisis, no, sorry, not doing that, right? We don't, get to, we don't get to make that choice. Our covenant was to mourn with people whatever is causing them mourning, to comfort them whatever they need comfort with, to bear whatever their burdens look like. Now the covenant goes on, there will be a time to stand as a witness at all times, in all places, in all things, there'll be a time. But, but for whatever reason, this covenant was written in such a way that the first thing we do is to mourn with those who mourn and comfort those who stand in need of comfort. We don't relinquish our testimony. We don't have to give an inch on our testimony. We can remain firm in the things that, that, that we believe and with, that we know, even when the people around us are struggling, but we are called to love. And why? Because that is exactly what Jesus does with us in whatever our burdens are, whatever our form of mourning, whatever we need comfort. Jesus stands first in love, not in judgment. Remember, we love God because he loved us first. So for all of us, whether people who are feeling switched off or whether for those, who are, those of us who are still in the church and feeling switched on, for all of us, the Christian virtues still apply, that we show love to one another that we try to exercise hope for better relationships and a better future, that we're generous towards one another, that we forgive when needed, right? All of those things that we are humble, recognizing that we don't know everything. We certainly don't know what's in other people's hearts and heads. We don't know everything in history. We don't know everything about anything, right? So humility. So all these things that we're taught in the church, all these Christian virtues apply both as we minister to those who are in faith crisis and as people go through faith, faith crisis themselves. Okay, so that's a little bit about switched off. Let, let, me move, let me move on and talk about these other two categories and then I'll close and we'll, we'll have a few minutes for questions. Okay, so if that was switched off, so what about squeezed out? So you hear what I mean by this is people who are struggling with the church because of social or cultural issues and they're not sure if there's a place for them in this church. They, they, they wonder if it, they, they feel constrained or they feel squeezed out and they're, and they're not sure that this is a place where they can worship Christ, okay? Now, these, this can be all kinds of things, um, but the, the things that most directly confront the issue today or the, the, confront the church today are issues around uh, women's equality and women's leadership in the church and then LGBTQ issues, okay? And in, in a lot of ways, actually, in recent years, these issues in some ways have eclipsed uh, some of the issues that, that the kind of switched off type issues, but, but all of them are, are still in play. Well, you know, these are tough issues. These are tough issues because as a community, we're still learning and we're still growing. Now, think, it, think just how much we've learned and grown as a community, as a church in the past few years around women's leadership. And about women's roles. Think about what we've learned in recent years about the relationship of women and the priesthood and the way that women exercise priesthood in the temple, in the home, in the church. Think about everything that President Oaks and others of the brethren and sisters have taught us about this. We have learned so much. We are growing in our understanding of what priesthood is and what priesthood means and how it is exercised by men and by women. That's a great thing. So we still, we're, we're still growing. We're still learning. Think how much we've grown in terms of incorporating women in leadership positions and actually respecting and listening to their voices in ward councils, in stake councils, in all kinds of settings, right? Have we figured it all out yet? Heavens no, right? We're still wrestling with this. There's still a lot of women who feel like their voices are unheard and their experiences are not validated. We have a long way to go, okay? But we are learning so much as a church and I think we're better now than we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago. And so we're still learning. And, uh, and I think the Lord is teaching us and hopefully we're listening. 
uh, what it means and what the proper relationship between men and women are within the church and how priesthood is, uh, is for all of God's children in the various ways that it's exercised, okay? So we're learning there. LGBTQ issues, I mean, these things, these, these issues have, have raised up just in my lifetime, for sure, really, in, in my adult lifetime over the past 20, 25, 30 years, right? And we, I, I think we can all admit, we are all learning and growing and stretching here in an area that just wasn't on our radar in any significant way a generation or two ago. And there are a lot of people who are struggling. There is a lot of pain in the church right now. There is a lot of people with a lot of questions right now about whether this church can be a place for them to find Christ and to worship Christ. Now, I don't have all the answers. I sustain the brethren, the prophets and apostles whose prerogative it is to receive revelation and declare doctrine for the church. But what can we do at a local level even while we're still growing and learning and figuring things out? Well, the one thing we're all called to do is to be Christians, to love. My wife and I, we've, we've lived in, in lots of different places. We've lived around the world. We've lived in, in branches and wards, uh, not only throughout the United States, but also in places like Egypt and Romania. And, uh, and one of the things that we've loved about the wards and branches that we've been in, especially outside the Western United States, where, where the church is sparser, and especially in places like Romania and Egypt, where it's really sparse. But when you walk into one of those wards and branches, and maybe some of you have been in, in those kinds of branches and, and wards as well, when you walk in, the feeling is, or when anybody walks in those doors, the feeling is, thank you for being here. <laughs> We're glad you're here. We don't care what you're wearing. We don't care what you look like. You know, we, we don't care. I mean, just thank you for being here. We're glad that you've come and want to worship with us. And we're gonna figure this out and we're one big happy family or one small happy family in some of those places, right? But the ethos is just, we're, we're just glad you're here. And that's what each one of us can do in our wards, in our branches, in our relief societies, in our elders' quorums, in our young women's classes, in our young men's classes, in all of these places, we can create space for everyone who wants to worship the Savior alongside us. If they want to walk in those doors or watch on Zoom right now, but, but if, if people want to be with us, we need to make space for them to be with us. That's what the Lord calls us to do. We may not have all the answers. We may still be figuring stuff out, but we do know how to love people. And that's what God calls us to do. That's how we create space for the people who feel squeezed out to maybe breathe a little bit and to find a little space for them to feel comfortable in our community. And why do we do this? Because we are all God's children. I am convinced that God rejoices in the diversity he has made. Paul talks about the body of Christ with all of its different parts, right? The heart, the hands, the fingers, the toes, the, the head, all these kinds of things. Why? Because we all have different gifts. God has given all of his children different gifts, and we need all those gifts in the church. We don't just need a whole bunch of hands. We don't just need a whole bunch of toes or a whole bunch of livers, right? We want the whole thing. We want all of those gifts. And when the church looks like just a whole bunch of one body part, it's not as rich. It's not what God has called it to be. God calls us to bring in all of his children, the entire body, the entire family of God, so that we can be blessed by their gifts. And so I'm convinced, brothers and sisters, that we can make space for anybody who wants to be with us. We can do that. But it requires us to be anxiously engaged. We can't just be passive in this. We have to create space. That is an active thing that we have to do. We can't ask people who are feeling marginalized and alienated to make their own space. That's too much of a burden right? Now, they've got some decisions to, to you know, and, and, and it's hard that they already have enough on their plate if they're feeling squeezed out. So we need to do all we can to create space 
for as many people as we can. That's what we're called to do. All right, finally, as I, as I move towards wrapping up, third category, people who feel tuned out. There's a lot of people who just feel kind of bored. And maybe you're feeling that way right now. I apologize, okay? But there's a lot of people who are not sure that this church, uh, that there's that much to it. They're not sure that there's much fire here, that there's much going on here. And there's a lot of people who just feel tuned out. They're not, they're, they're not spiritually on fire. They're, they're, they're not sure that this is a place where they can give or that their great, greatest energies will be rewarded. Now, this is not new, this kind of feeling within religion. It's not unique to, to our church. One of the great uh, figures in 20th century American religion was a guy named Abraham Joshua Heschel. He was a Jewish rabbi, one of the great leaders of 20th century Judaism. And he wrote a book in 1955 called God in Search of Man. And we normally think of the 1950s as like the high point of religion in America. And in fact, during that decade, more people attended church than any other decade in American history. Okay, so, so it was a high watermark in lots of ways. But even then, Rabbi Heschel looked around and he saw that not everything was right. And he wrote this book that opens with this uh, passage, which is really strong stuff. It's powerful stuff. Rabbi Heschel says, it is customary to blame secular science and anti-religious philosophy for the eclipse of religion in modern society. In other words, we, we, we blame Darwin and Freud and Marx and, and all those anti-religious people for all the problems we have, okay? But Rabbi Heschel says it would be more honest to blame religion for its own defeats. Religion declined not because it was refuted, not because Darwin came up with some argument that proved that religion was wrong. Religion declined not because it was refuted, but because it became irrelevant, dull, oppressive, and insipid. When faith is completely replaced by creed, worship by discipline, love by habit. When the crisis of today is ignored because of the splendor of the past. When faith becomes an heirloom rather than a living fountain. When religion speaks only in the name of authority rather than with the voice of compassion, its message becomes meaningless. Those are strong words. But I think more than a half century later, they still speak to us because I think there's too many among us, too many in the broader Christian world, those charts with Christians going like this and unaffiliated going like this, there are too many people for whom their religion is irrelevant, dull, oppressive, and insipid. Well, I'm convinced, brothers and sisters, it doesn't have to be that way. I'm convinced that the restoration does not have to be that way, that we can offer something better than that, and we do offer something better than that to people. It is the task of every generation of the church to rediscover the gospel anew. Every generation has to do it. We cannot, we talk about not just leaning on, on, on other people's testimonies, but we can't rely on the past generation's successes. The Pioneers Church was for the pioneers. Your grandparents' church was for your grandparents. Today, we have been called to have this church. It, it is our church. It's not the Pioneers Church anymore. They, they fought the good fight. They're, they're, they've met their heavenly reward. It is our church. And we have to rediscover it and breathe new life into it for a new generation, for today, for 2021. We cannot rely just on uh, the same old, same old. This is what President Nelson is teaching us. I, he's, he's invigorating the church as a, what, 90, what is he, 95 or whatever, right? He is breathing new life into the church and telling us that we can't just do the same things the same way all the time. We have to breathe new life into this thing. It's what it means to believe in an ongoing restoration. We also believe, why, why bother sticking with this church? Why bother coming to church? Why bother with any of it? Well, I am convinced that the church is one of the great gifts that God has given us to learn how to love. The two great laboratories that God has given us to learn how to love are the family and the church. Why those two things? Because they're the two communities, especially in terms of the Latter-day Saint understanding of church. They're the two things with, where you're surrounded by people that you didn't choose. 
you didn't choose which family, you get to choose who you marry. So there's one thing, but after that, right? You don't choose the family you're born into. You don't choose the kids who come into your family unless you adopt, but even then you can't choose what they do after that, right? You don't get to choose your family. You're just told to love. Same thing in the church. The, the, the most, I think one of the most beautiful things about the restored church is the way we organize ourselves. We take a map, we draw a line, and we say, love everybody inside that line. That's your job. So yeah, the person next to you has who has political signs that drive you crazy, love that person. The person down the road whose kids drive too fast down the road, love that person, All right? The person who gets up and speaks in church and drives you crazy, love that person. You don't get to choose which church you go to. You don't get to go to a liberal church or a conservative church or a, you know, a fancy church. Or I mean, you don't get to choose any of that stuff. This is the church you go to. Figure it out. Learn to love people. It is a beautiful, it is the only way to make Christians. It's the only way to make Christians. Because it's easy to love the people you like. It's hard to love the people that you're stuck with. And that's exactly what the Lord calls us to do. And then over time, we realize, oh, maybe it's not so bad being stuck with them. Maybe actually they have something to teach me. And so the church is a laboratory of love. And, and it is exciting when we think about it that way, when we think about the challenge that's associated with being part of the church, it's anything but irrelevant and oppressive and insipid. It's actually transformative. Last thing I want to say here is, is to think about our identity as Christians and what our mission is. And I want to go back to the original statement of Christianity. And I, what I mean by that is what Jesus said the first time he got up to publicly preach. When he announced his public ministry as the Messiah. Remember, he got up in the synagogue in Nazareth. And he went up and he opened the scroll to what we understand as Isaiah chapter 61. And he read these words. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. We know this because we know what Jesus did over the next three years in terms of his ministry. This was his mission statement. This is exactly what he did. He fulfilled to a T what he said when he got up in that synagogue in Nazareth. He was surrounded by people who were poor, not only poor in spirit, but actually poor. And his ministry was to them. He was surrounded by the brokenhearted, not just people who had broken hearts and contrite spirits and chose to follow him, but people who, whose hearts had been broken because of life. The same is true of us today. Think about the people who, are, who surround you whose hearts are broken because of global pandemics or divorces or deaths or financial setbacks or a million other things that break our hearts. Jesus came for them. Think about all those who are captive, not only spiritually in bondage, but actually in bondage in lots of different ways. We know that slavery still exists in some places in this world. We know people who are in bondage financially or captive to bad marriages or all kinds of things. Jesus came for them. Think about those who are blind. Yes, spiritually blind, but also actually blind and deaf and disabled. Jesus ministered to them. And who among us isn't bruised just by going through this life in a million different ways? Jesus is the Messiah of the poor. He's the Messiah of the brokenhearted. He's the Messiah of the captive. He's the Messiah of the blind. He's the Messiah of the bruised. And if we're followers of Jesus, he asks us to do the same. His mission statement 
becomes our mission statement. This is what we're called to do. He did it in a unique way that none of us can replicate, of course, but he calls us to do it right alongside him. I can't think of anything more exciting, more meaningful, more transformative, the opposite of irrelevant and oppressive and dull and insipid. I cannot think of anything more transformative than this. This is what I want to do with my life. I want to minister to the poor, the broken heart of the captive, the blind, the bruised. I'm not very good at it, but I'm in a place that teaches me and gives me opportunities to get better. That's what Jesus calls us to do. So for people who feel tuned out, maybe what we need to do is actually do what Jesus asks us to do and invite them to do it alongside us. And I'm convinced, brothers and sisters, that we can do that, that, this is, that the church is exactly the gift that he's given us to do that. In, the, in Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about Christ's ministry, it talks about what Christ was called to do. But now in Christ Jesus, you were, who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. In the church today, in our families, in our communities, in our wards, there are people who feel far off because they're switched off or they're squeezed out or they're tuned out. There are people who are feeling far off. Jesus proclaims peace to them. They're feeling pain, they're feeling betrayal, they're feeling alienation. Jesus proclaims peace. There are also people who are near, who are still in the church, who are as active as ever, but whose hearts are also broken because the people they love are struggling. And they're not sure what to do, and they're confused, and they're struggling, and Jesus proclaims peace to them. Jesus isn't concerned so much with our categories of who's far off and who's near, and he's certainly not interested in the walls that we sometimes build between us, except to break down those walls. What Jesus cares about is calling each one of us to return and in proclaiming peace to each one of us. We talk about being part of a restored church Brothers and sisters, we're also participants in a restoring church, a church that is still working to restore our Heavenly Father and Mother's children to wholeness. That's what we're called to do. Whatever the issues are, whether it be faith crisis or whether it be a million other ways in which people are broken and bruised in this world, we are called to a ministry of healing and to a ministry of peace, just like Jesus is. And we can do this with confidence in our Savior. And I say this in his holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to stop this chair. We've, we've got uh, the screen share. We've, we've got time for, uh, for a few questions. And I'm going to try and uh, moderate this myself. But uh, I think you're looking at it, too. So let me know if, if, if I miss anything. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'll, I've got the one in Q&A here, and, and we'll just uh, take a few minutes, and, and people here, I know you're not on your phones, but you can ask questions too, so I mean, you're, uh, that's, that's all right too. Okay, so this question is, given the recent media interest in people like David Koresh, uh, you know, Warren Jeffs, etc., how do we respond to those who see parallels in Joseph Smith's leadership? I think that, that's, that's a great question, and um, you know, we, in, in our church and in our community, we love and respect Joseph Smith as the prophet of the restoration, right? We know all the things that God did through him to bring about this church and to bring about this, uh, restored scriptures and priesthood and ordinances and covenants and all the things that we love, right? But it doesn't take very much as a, as a student or as, of, of church history to, to know that Joseph Smith was not perfect, never claimed to be perfect. And actually one of the things I like about the, the church's new series 
um, uh, the saints, the multi-volume history of the church is, I think it's uh, actually quite honest about many of Joseph Smith's foibles uh, and flaws, and he had many. In section one of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord talked about how he called Joseph Smith to speak to this age and to restore the gospel, but he says he called him not because Joseph Smith was anything special, but he says he called him in his weakness. And so the Lord was as aware, more aware than anyone of Joseph Smith's many flaws. But this is the remarkable thing. We're not members of the church of Joseph Smith. We respect him. We love him just like we love one another despite our flaws. Joseph Smith was not a perfect vessel. We don't have to claim that he was a perfect vessel. It does not diminish the restoration to be honest about Joseph Smith's flaws. Now, as a historian and as a scholar of religion, I think we can weigh people's flaws. You know, I mean, it's everybody's scale and balance is going to be a little bit different in terms of what really matters to them. I think on the whole, Joseph Smith comes out pretty well in, in balance, but it's not my job to weigh Joseph Smith in the balance. He has an eternal judge who's going to do that. But what I do weigh in the balance are the things that came through Joseph Smith. And I find those to be true and compelling. And so, um, so no, Joseph Smith is not Warren Jeffs. Uh, he, he's, he's, not some, he's not David Koresh. Uh, he's not a cult leader, but he's also not perfect. We don't have to claim that he was perfect. In fact, when we claim that Joseph Smith is perfect, it diminishes the work, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, right? Think about the Bible, the, 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 the story of the Bible and the prophets in the Bible, the, the, the Bible is littered with prophets who are deeply flawed. I mean, read the Old Testament, okay? These are, it, it, it's like, read the Testament, but the Old Testament, but don't let your kids read the whole, the whole Old Testament. I mean, there's some scary stuff in there, right? Okay, and there's some bad characters in there and some of them are prophets. <laughs> But the whole story of the Old Testament is of God working through imperfect people, God redeeming his people despite their imperfections. God doesn't abandon his people even when they turn their back on him. The same model is true of Joseph Smith and any of our modern prophets. They are not perfect. They don't claim to be perfect. We don't claim that they're perfect. But we do claim that Jesus is working through them. And so, uh, so, so I think, yeah, we, we, we can take into account and we can study and we can look at Joseph Smith's character. Again, on the whole, I find him to be an admirable character, but he's not perfect. Um, and we don't have to claim to. We are, in the, we are members of the Church of Jesus Christ, not the Church of Joseph Smith. Okay, um, okay so I'm going to go to chat now to, to some of these. And, and uh, this is going to be... Um, uh, a little bit random. I'm, I'm going to go through um, and, and see what I can. Um, one person says that uh, uh, their faith crisis started after reading the church approved sources. Um, and, and that's uh, the gospel topics books and, and, and saints. And, and I know that you're not alone. Um, this is one of the things I, I, I'm privy a little bit to, to some of the process that, that went behind those gospel topics essays and the saints. Um, and, this was, one of the, this was one of the big conversations that happened among the leadership of the church. They said, we want to be transparent. We want to be honest about our history. We, we, we feel like we've got nothing to hide. We're not gonna run from the truth. We're not gonna run from the facts. So we're not afraid of those things. I mean, the Joseph Smith Papers Project, it's amazing. I mean, they're pouring tons of resources and publishing literally every document that's ever, that, that Joseph Smith ever wrote or, or ever touched. So, I mean, so talk about an effort in transparency, right? But they also knew that in doing so and in putting these things on the church website, in talking about the imperfections and weaknesses and challenges in these things and doing it in official church sources, that there were going to be some people who's testimonies were shaken by that, not by what they found on some random Google site, but what they found on the church website. And I know that there were some really tough and hard conversations about, about this. 
And we do know that for some people, uh, it's, it's precisely those things that they encountered on approved church resources that, that led to questions that they didn't have before. But the calculation was this. They said, we know that this is going to be tough and we know that there's going to, there's, it's going to be difficult for some people, but um, in the long term, it's going to pay off when people are raised in the church when some, because a lot of these things are finding their way into church curriculum, into seminary and institute and to other kinds of things. And so, so especially for people who are raised in the church, hearing about these kinds of things, then when they go to college or when they go and encounter some of this stuff on Google, it's not going to be, what? How come nobody ever told me this? It's, instead, it's going to be, oh, I learned that in primary. So we are in that moment of transition where we're still, this is hard for a lot of us who, who were raised sometimes with one narrative of church history, and now we're getting a different, a slightly different narrative of church history from the church itself. There's this moment of transition, which isn't, which isn't easy for some people. Um, in the long run, um, the, 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 the church has, has made its bet with, with being honest and forthright and, and talking about all these things and with the confidence that we can do so in a context of faith, that again, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, um, that this is the church of Jesus Christ. So, um, so for, so for who, whoever is struggling, you know, if, if, if you're, you know, if, if it is those resources that, that have um, caused you just to, to struggle, I, I'm sorry. And, and again, those, those are things that, that the brethren were, were aware of and knew could be the case. Um, but they obviously felt confident enough that, uh, that they felt like the, 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 the church is still true, right? Um, but uh, but we, can, we can still talk about these things. Um, let me... Um, uh, I'm, I'm just scrolling through the see in Q and A. Sorry, it's hard to do two things at once here. Um, if I have friends that now don't belong to any organized religion, how do we have conversations with them? Um, do we tiptoe around religion, or do we open up about how we feel? I think this is a great question, because and this is going to be more and more the case as more and more people aren't part of organized religion, right? Um, I think we're we're honest about who we are. I mean, being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is, is a huge part of who I am. And for the people I care about, for my friends and others, I'm, I'm not going to hide that part of it uh, any more than I'm going to hide that I'm a huge Notre Dame football fan, right? Uh, now, in the long run, one of those things is more important than the other. On any given Saturday afternoon, I'm not sure which is uh, the, most, the most important, but, um, but it's, it's, it's who we are, right? And so why would we hide that from them? Now, I think we have to sometimes get better at how we talk with people about religion, um, a lot of people don't like religion, and a lot of people have left religion because they felt like it's been shoved down their throats or they've been harmed by it. And we have to be sensitive to that. We don't want to be the cause of, of any greater alienation. We don't want to be the cause of any more harm or of people feeling further pushed away from religion. We want to be uh, the, 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 the Catholic saint, uh, Francis of Assisi, he said, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. Right? That the, the quality of our example would be the greatest testimony that we give to the, to the nature of our Christianity. Uh, but we should use words too, right? especially among our friends. We want to talk honestly about the things that are important to us, but we don't want to shove it down people's throats. We, we want to have the conversations that they want to have. And one of the things that we need to do better as Latter-day Saints is listen to other people's questions. We, we sometimes get caught in kind of a game of jeopardy where we give, uh, you know, we, the, where, where the only good uh, answers are the ones where, where people, or, or the only good questions are the ones where the answers are already given, you know, because we feel like we have so many answers. And so we want to force that on people as if, you know, we know what their questions are. But a lot of times people aren't asking the questions that we think they are. We, we've, we've sort of constructed a set of questions that we think people have, but they don't always have those questions. We need to actually listen to people. And this is not just missionaries. Missionaries need to do, need to do this, but we all need to do this. We need to, what, what do people care about? What are they concerned about? What are they afraid of? What are they anxious about? And are there things that the restoration can speak to? And so we, ha we, have, to, we have to speak 
um, their language. And, and again, in, in, in love, but also in confidence, but without arrogance. Uh, one question is, can you name something specific that you think Joseph Smith did wrong? Hearing they aren't perfect is not really addressing the issue for me. No one is perfect. Of course, that's right. So, okay, so what, what did Joseph Smith uh, do wrong? I mean, we, we can talk about specific things. I think um, that uh, he, was, uh, he was not always fully honest, especially in public, about the, the practice of polygamy. Uh, we know, uh, and again, the, the church's gospel topics essay is very uh, open about this. Uh, when it was, when the, the practice was introduced in Nauvoo, it was practiced in secret. It was practiced among a very small group of people uh, that slowly expanded. Um, but that most members of the church in Nauvoo, and certainly the members of the church in England and other places outside of Nauvoo, were, were not aware of what was going on. When Joseph Smith was challenged about some of these things, uh, he gave statements that I think, um, as, a, as a historian, I, I would say at best they mis were misleading um, and obfuscating. Uh, and uh, he was he was in a he was in a he was in a pickle, and he uh, and he was not always fully forthright. He wasn't always fully honest about his practice, including to his own wife. And so, so as I look at that, I, that's, that's one of the hard things for me when I look at, at, at Joseph. Um, uh, and so, um, so yeah, we, we, we can talk about specific th things and saints talks about that, right? So again, we don't need Joseph Smith to be perfect. Uh, and so, um, so yeah, sometimes it's tough. Okay, going through chat is a little bit tough. L let me... Let me do one thing, and then I think we're uh, about out of time. Yeah, so there is, is there one? There is one at the end of the stream. And, and, um, what was it, I think? Which one? Address. This one right here. How do I trust again yeah. when that was broken? OK. Yeah. So the question is, how do I trust again when, when that trust was broken? That's, that's a million dollar question. I think that's a really good place to end. Um, because it is, like I said, it's, it's just like uh, relationships. Um, it, is, it is really hard to rebuild that trust. A couple of things uh, that I would say. So first of all, it is, uh, it is important to, you know, one of the constant messages in the Book of Mormon especially, but throughout scripture, is to remember. Uh, it's, it is essential for us to remember the Lord's mercies in our lives. To remember the times, remember the spiritual witnesses that we've had, to remember the times when the Spirit has touched us, when reading the Book of Mormon, or when preaching the gospel, or when sitting in church and hearing the gospel, when listening to general conference, when listening to the prophets and apostles. It's really important to remember that and hold on to those things. It's also really important, I think, to hold on to relationships. And so here I'm not just talking about the relationship with the church, but relationships with people inside the church, with our family members uh, and others. That's, that's one of the key things is that, um, the, that even in these, these relationships where, uh, that have been predicated in so many ways upon the church and membership, and this is especially true in marriages, right? Where two people get married and, and, and they get sealed in the temple and the understanding is they're going to be faithful members of the church. And, and then if, if one ch uh, changes their mind, that can be really difficult. Um, but there are ways, you know, to hold on to that relationship, uh, even while one person is struggling with their relationship to the church. So holding on to people and holding on to, to the love and the relationships we have. I, I had uh, a friend tell me once uh, who had left the church. Uh, he said, you know, I, I could win the Nobel Prize and my mom would still be disappointed in me because I don't go to church on Sunday, right? Now, on the one level, I get that. I understand that, you know, the, the, the kind of no empty seats at the table in the celestial kingdom and so forth. But here's the thing. Our heavenly mother and heavenly father care and love for us in ways that go so far beyond what we understand, Right. So whatever feelings of loss or hurt or or, you know, other things we're feeling, we can trust that we have heavenly parents who are reaching after 
reach, reaching out after each one of their children. So that, so that's that's for you know for for the people who are who are struggling, but but still, the, the the question is about the people whose trust has been broken in the church. How do we rebuild that? I think it's done bit by bit, little by little. It's finding a foothold wherever we can. Right? It may not all come at once. It, it may come by having to to separate some things, and it has to come also through through reworking some of our ideas. What, about what that relationship may be. It, it's probably going to look a little bit differently on the other side than it did before somebody went through a faith crisis. And that's okay, right? It is okay for our religion to grow up with us. It is okay for our religion to survive some bumps and bruises and some scrapes along the way. That's called growing up. We, we do this in every other area of our life, right? No marriage is perfect, but, but it survives, Right, and and we and we learn to forgive, and then we're generous, and 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 we we accept the other person even with all of their their flaws. Now it means that sometimes we have to reconsider what that means, right? That the, the that the person isn't as perfect as we thought they were on the day we got married, right? But we learn and grow, and so rebuilding trust in the church can look a lot the same way. Is that that we learn that we're not in relationship with a perfect thing, a perfect institution, a perfect, but, but we are in relationship as part of a community that is striving to follow Christ and striving to come to Christ. And so finding footholds wherever we can. So if, if, if you're struggling with the church, but love the Book of Mormon, dive into the Book of Mormon. If you're struggling with the Book of Mormon, but love the church, come and keep coming to church, right? Find whatever footholds you can and build upon that. The, the, the Lord talked about in section 93 and in other places that we, we go grace from grace. And a lot of times this is exactly what it means to have a testimony is we go from grace to grace. We don't know all things. And oftentimes in the church, we use this language of knowledge a lot, especially from a pulpit like this. I know, I know, I know. That's beautiful. It's powerful. It is rich. It is one of the great spiritual gifts that we've been given as Latter-day Saints, that we know so many things and that so many of us feel like we've been given a witness of the Spirit in such a way that we can say, I know X, Y, or Z. But we can't always say that all the time, and not everybody among us can say that. And so it's okay. Remember what in Alma chapter 32, he talks about if you have even a desire for these things, that's good. If you have a desire to know these things. So if somebody is asking the question, my trust is broken, but how do I rebuild it? That is great because that shows desire. That's what the Lord wants. And so if somebody can't say, I know, but they can say, I hope, or I wish, or I believe, or I want, or I desire, that's pretty good stuff too. The Lord can take that. The Lord is pleased with that, even with the smallest seed of desire. And so build on that. Build on that. Build wherever you can find a handhold or a foothold, whatever that looks like. Keep the relationships you have. Keep talking with people. Read the scriptures. Pray. Hold on to Jesus, who will always hold on to you. There's so much more to talk about. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everything, brothers and sisters. But let me just leave uh, with, with my testimony. First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm available. I live right here in Logan. You can find me very easily if you want to email me about any specific questions about church history or just want to find somebody friendly to talk to. The fact that you've got a stake presidency uh, who set this up shows that you've got leaders who care and are happy to talk about these things and who are not afraid of talking about hard things. This is what it means to minister to each other. We're not, you know, we don't love it when people get cancer, but we're not afraid of it, right? Uh, we don't, you know, uh, we, we, when people struggle with various things, we mourn with them, we comfort with them. Uh, this is what we do in the church. And so, uh, so feel free to reach out, feel free to do whatever uh, can be done. But let me just leave with, with my final testimony. I, 
uh, I'm 44 years old, and uh, which is not very old, but older than some. Uh, it, like it's almost it's like almost perfectly middle aged, right? I'm like so stereotypically middle aged in so many ways. I've got the bald patch. I've got you know all the the, the, the paunch, like so many things. So. Um, I've had some experiences, I haven't had others, so I'm still waiting for others. I'm still raising kids, I'm still in the thick of it, all these, you know, in the middle of mid-career, all these kinds of things. But I also feel like that over the past several years and the last couple decades, that I've grown in my testimony the more that I have focused on Jesus Christ. And it has become more and more meaningful to me to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. I am grateful that President Nelson has reminded us that this is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We are part of a restored and restoring church. We are grateful for the restoration of so many things. We're grateful for the restoration of priesthood and of covenants and of ordinances and of doctrine and of all kinds of things. But ultimately, I've become convinced that those things were always just a means to an end. And that our Heavenly Father and Mother, what they want more than anything else in the world is the restoration of their family. They want to bring us all back. They've given us the church to help do this. They've given us families to help do this, but they've mostly called us to do this in whatever way we can. There's nothing I want more in this life in my middle age than to simply be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus. And the Spirit has witnessed to me and a million experiences have witnessed to me that this church is an extraordinary place to become a Christian. There are other good places to do it too. I got lots of good friends and lots of other churches who are amazing Christians who put me to shame. But this is a church where God has called me and has placed me to learn how to love. And I'm grateful for that. I am grateful to have prophets and apostles and scriptures and bishops and Relief Society presidents and all kinds of things around me to teach me how to love and to help me learn how to love because that's all I wanna do. That's all, I'm not very good at it, but I want to. And I think the church, I know the church can help us do that. And so for me, it's worth holding on to with everything I've got, even as we love every single one of our Heavenly Father and Mother's children who are struggling, because that's what we're called to do. I witness that Jesus is the Christ, that he is our peace. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We appreciate uh, Brother Mason very much for uh, being with us tonight. Um, we had, I don't know, an excess of 20 uh, questions come in. We apologize we're not able to get to those, but that would add probably another hour to the, the fireside beyond what we uh, have allotted. Uh, we, we have recorded it and we'll uh, likely have this up on our uh, Facebook page, Cash West Stake Facebook page uh, later on if you missed uh, something. Uh, so we uh, thank Patrick Mason very much. Thank you for attending uh, tonight as well. Um, Brother Brian Fowler will give us our closing prayer. Father in heaven, we come before thee and thank thee for this opportunity as a body of thy saints who have come to learn and to be taught. We're grateful for the spirit which has been here that has taught us the principles that we needed to learn this night. Father, we pray for thy spirit to be poured out upon the members of our stake, that we will be better Christians and followers of thy son, Jesus Christ, that we will be better individuals in our homes, in our community, in our families, and wherever we are called to stand. 
We pray that the Spirit will always be with us so that we may know thy will, that we may know the principles that Jesus Christ has taught, that we may be able to understand and become more like him. Father, we're grateful for the things that Brother Mason has shared with us and through his teachings, his understanding, his learning. Help us to take what we need this night and become better so that we may be able to gather one another together. We may be able to help those who are struggling in any way. We may be the kind of minister that thou has called us to be. We love thee, Father. We thank thee for this opportunity in our lives. And we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.